So I'm going to be talking about memory leaks and uh, some of the trouble we've had and so on. Uh, before I start, I want to say that this was originally an internal presentation that ran on for a couple of hours and was a show and tell. You know, I, uh, we all were trying out things and so on. I've been trying to size it down uh, for this, but yesterday I had a charger malfunction, so I was just doing it now. So there are going to be a couple of raw things in this. You have to bear with that. Uh, the second thing is I'm notorious for talking really fast. So if one of, if you see that I'm talking fast, you have to let me know. I'll slow down. <laughs> all right. <coughs> so uh, I'm Vishnu Iyengar. And I work uh, at Alexa on the top dot routine. And that's my Twitter and GitHub handle. You should be talking the mic. Yeah. Okay. okay. Is this better? Do it use other mic if you want. No, I think it's easier. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the topics we had memory leaks, right? So let's start with uh, how do you know that you have a memory leak? So uh, relevant to this is the application that we're building, which is top dot two. It's a chat solution, and among the various parts of a chat solution is a chat client. So, because we wanted to build a chat client and we wanted it available on different platforms, mobile, on machines, uh, you know, desktop, and so on, and on the web, and we wanted to build different clients for these, uh, we thought we'd cheat and we'll just build one client for both web and desktop. <coughs> so, it's essentially a web client, and on the desktop, we bundle uh, this with the browser, and we make a few, we have an additional component in there which gives you the desktop like features. So it's a web client, but it's very different because you know people expect it to act like a desktop client, which means that you have expectations of being able to run it for a very long time. You know, you run it for days at a time, and uh, <clears throat> it's also the kind of—I uh, mean, because it's a chat client, there's stuff that's constantly going on. You know, uh, first of all, your engagement with it is, is large. You're on it quite a bit of the day, where you're ch chatting with people. Uh, messages keep coming in. People go online and offline. Your roster has to change. So all this stuff that's going on. <coughs> So, uh, you know, we were working on this for quite a bit and every once in a while we release uh, something new when we are testing it. The QA guys pull it and they tell us, okay, move this box and the three pixels to the right, that sort of thing. And it all seems fine until uh, we release it and then you go ask people, you know, how, how are things, how do you like the client? And uh, people are like, yeah, it's okay. And, you know, you want to know what you did wrong. So you dig a little more and then they say, it's really slow. And uh, that doesn't make sense, you know, modern browsers are pretty fast, uh, JavaScript is, has changed so much, are they using an old browser, you're not sure what it is. So you go to their machine, you start the client up, and it's fine. And then they say, yeah, it's fine now, you know, wait a couple of hours, it becomes really slow. Uh, that's usually a good sign that you have a memory leak, right? It's, uh, <coughs> in fact, they tell, tell you things like, uh, I'm uh, doing something else and I get a ping because somebody's messaged me, and I switch to the client, and it takes so long for the client to come up. It takes so long for me to click and do anything. So what that means is that you're using a lot of memory and ultimately the OS has started paging your uh, stuff out of memory. And now when you switch back, it's pulling stuff back from uh, hard disk. And hard disk is just way slower than memory. So that's the problem. So that's when you know you have a memory leak. And um, the kind of applic applications that have memory leaks are essentially what I mentioned. I mean, most web applications are short-lived. You know, you're on the page for, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes to half an hour. Uh, the ones that are there for a long time is where you start to have a problem. Because on a short, on a client that's short-lived, you don't have to worry. I mean, you know, even if you leak memory, you're not going to notice. But this client is something which has a huge number of elements. It's a fairly large application. So that's one thing that's going to lead to memory leaks. Uh, the second part is, I mean, you've got dynamic elements that are constantly being created and destroyed. I chat with somebody, I create a chat tab. Somebody comes online, I create an element to represent that person, and so on. So there's elements being created and destroyed all the time. And it's got to stay away, you know, stay online for like uh, three, four days, a week, whatever. <coughs> However long the uh, user wants to keep it. So you can't afford to leak memory at this point. And uh, the other thing that sort of contribute to this is, if you have a large enough team or the code base is complex enough, then you know, you can't work with a simplified model. You start, doing various, you start using various abstractions that are commonly uh, used powerful for this kind of thing. You start using a component-based model, you have widgets developed by different people. And as the scale becomes large, it's harder to reason about what's going on. And all these things contribute to, you know, first of all, there being a memory leak, and then it being hard to, you know, even discover that the memory leak exists. So, uh, let's talk about how you can get memory leaks in uh, JavaScript. So, back when we all learned C, uh, there was this point where you learn about how you allocate memory. Every time you want to create an object, it gets allocated on the heap. And when you're done, you delete it. And I, I mean, memory leaks meant that you forgot to delete something that you allocated. But uh, you know, 
JavaScript is memory managed. You shouldn't have to do all that. So what's happening? So the question is, how is memory reclaimed on uh, JavaScript, <coughs> right? So uh, really, it comes down to this whole thing about scope. When you say new object, whatever, JavaScript's allocating memory on the heap. And it's waiting till that uh, reference is out of scope, until there's no references pointing to your object. And then it's going to reclaim it. And that's really all it is. So uh, I mean, it should be fairly simple to deal with. I mean, things get a little complex with closures, because JavaScript has closures, right? If I retain a function, the function has access to everything that was in scope at that point in time. So technically, it's possible that you'll be holding on to stuff that you don't realize you're holding on to. Uh, and you've got to figure out you know, what gets held and what doesn't. All right. At this point, I'm going to switch to the demo. And uh, if I can figure out how, oh, there we go. Right. So let's actually take a look at this. So I've got this. Uh, I mean, this is the HTML file. And in most of these cases, I'm not actually going to switch to the file and then switch back to uh, Chrome. Now, I'm going to use Chrome for this uh, uh, because the Chrome's web inspector is really good, especially if you're trying to figure out what's going on in the heap and so on. So uh, we'll be using that as an example. Obviously, different browsers are going to have different tools, and they're all not going to work the same way. Right. OK. This is uh, a really, really, uh, I mean, there's nothing in this file, really, right? I've just created this object first with the uh, uh, little manner, and then I'm creating the ob an object using the constructor mechanism. So you've got uh, the stuff and another. Now, uh, the first question is, you know, how long is this object going to stay on the heap, both of these? Forever. Forever. So if we switch to Chrome, and I'm just going to take a heap snapshot. Now, uh, we're looking for this thing that was called movie. This is the slowest part of the presentation. I'm searching for the stuff. Let's search. Oh, there we go. Much better. Right. So we can see this is the uh, one we created. Now, there are two objects, and uh, one of them actually represents the uh, uh, what should they function itself, so it's a little confusing. So yeah, you can see this is here, and I want to take it out of uh, <coughs> this thing. So uh, we know it's called another, right? Now I say delete another. Uh, does this work, or does it save into another? That's fine. Let's take another snapshot. And we can actually do a comparison. Let me switch now, does it? Uh, so you can see it's not here, right? It didn't seem to clear it. Uh, let me switch away from the comparison mode. Oh, I can switch now. There's still two objects. It didn't clear it, even though I deleted it. So uh, this was the first gotcha. It confused us for a long time. Uh, the problem is the console. If you type something on the console, it's going to stay forever. So for the rest of the presentation, I can't use the console. So I'm just going to refresh this. I actually have to kill the tab just to make this work. All right, so let's do it again. I believe it should get deleted now. There we go. So we've lost one object. It's been deleted. So, <coughs> so this is, I mean, we just see that stuff can uh, be removed from scope. So now, uh, a lot of it is trying to figure out what is held in scope and what's not. Now, there's a second part to this, where I've got this uh, make object that's going to create a movie, but it's not going to let out of scope. In this case, clearly, we expect it not to live. So, uh, and I mean, so we should call the function, we can see that. And 
and I should just take another snapshot and you should, I mean the number of movies should be the same. There we go. Uh, and I was just one, but yeah, because I already deleted the first one. So there we go. So this is trivial. We see that uh, stuff is uh, removed from scope if you delete it from the global scope. Otherwise, as long as it's trapped in a scope, once the scope ends, it should vanish. So now let's take a look at what happens at closure. So when, when you try to uh, the reference is between when you see the console as a theme, the engine moves it into something of a uh, uh, which is not reclaimed as memory or? Uh, You're talking about how GC works, right? right? Yeah, I don't want to really get into the complications of GC because there's so many different implementations. And uh, I mean, I feel that's out of scope over here. But let's just talk about it at a very, very uh, rough uh, this thing for the sake of the discussion. I mean, you're right. Most of them probably use these generational GCs and so on. But at a basic level, we know that the way GC works is that when all the when the references come to that object is zero, it's going to be reclaimed. And old GCs used to have a problem. Old GCs used to have this problem where they would count the number of references to an object. Now you could have two objects referring to each other. And that's going to happen all the time. You'll have, uh, I mean, if you want to build a complex enough code base, you're going to end up with this cycle. Uh, and at one point, they could not clear it. But uh, no modern browser has this problem. So you will never have trouble with uh, cycles anymore. There's a second kind of cycle that people used to have trouble with. But I'll come to that when we talk about DOM. Uh, uh, all right, back we go. Oops, I forgot that I lost the. So a quick question. Um, let's say I have a DOM element. I detach it from my DOM, put it in a document fragment. And the document fragment was, let's say, in uh, a reference called A. And the scope <coughs> finishes and the document fragment is lost. So will all this DOM stuff also get cleared or this is just true for JavaScript variables? Can you hold on to that till we get to DOM? Oh, sure. Uh, the reason being that it becomes uh, more complex once you get to DOM. So I wanted to start with uh, just pure JavaScript for a bit. So uh, let's take a look at this one. This is closure scopes. So uh, here's this, I've got this button called make closure. Now, as I said, I'm not using the console, so I have to keep uh, look, showing you files and then pressing buttons on the screen. Uh, it's going to feel very clunky, but that's the best we can do at the moment. So yeah, I've got this function with, uh, with this button, which is going to call make closure. And um, so this is that movie object again. Uh, here's make closure, where I say make function and uh, I'm just, uh, what am I doing with that? Uh, yeah, I'm just, oh, I'm, ex I'm execu executing the function and putting the uh, return value in this uh, <coughs> div called closure, uh, which is up here, a span called closure. <coughs> Make function is going to create a movie and uh, return the function with the movie trapped in the closure, but it just returns a string, which is the title of the movie when you execute it. So it doesn't actually return the movie object. Now, Clearly, in this case, we know that it should be trapped in the scope. So let's actually look at that, and uh, then we can look at a <laughs> related piece. Oh, I broke it somewhere. Uh, that's not good. 55. If everybody sees it, let me know. Where is that? Function. Oh, no, wait. Uh, thank you. That's what you meant, right? Oh, just, oh, you think I did this? Okay, it's the same, but yeah, okay. I don't remember doing that. Alright. Um, so, let's refresh the page. Take a snapshot before. And uh, let's press the, press, press the button and take a snapshot again. Uh, now, one thing I've deliberately done is uh, in that, uh, where is the thing? Make closure. I've stored function in a global variable. I mean, that's deliberate. That's probably not what you're going to do in real life, but it's just to make a point in this case. Uh, and we should find uh, the movie. It's there. The same one I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, now the question is, if this is true, and closures trap objects, you know, then are we screwed? Because technically, inside a closure, you can access everything outside, right? 
So if you ever written a function, does that mean that every single thing that's been declared in outer scopes is caught? So this is a second experiment where uh, we're going to create four movies and uh, we decide that Twilight is not a Tarantino movie, so we only put the remaining in this Tarant movies array. And uh, now we're turning a function which is just going to randomly, uh, you know, uh, pick movies from this. And then we've got uh, this make suggestor, which I believe is the second button being called, which is now going to create this movie suggestor, which is supposed to suggest random Tarantino movies. And then I print the result 10 times. That's really all I'm doing. And uh, <clears throat> so we do the same thing. Uh, come back here. And uh, I've already taken snapshot before, so I do this. And uh, there we go. So Twilight's not in there. Uh, ideally, it would be great if Twilight is not caught in the scope. And uh, okay, we've got five. And we should see. And that's it, right? So clearly, uh, the browsers are smarter these days. If you're using a closure, it's only going to trap those things that are referenced in there. Now, they're doing some sort of parsing to figure this out. Clearly, there are places going to break. First of all, JavaScript has eval. If you eval, then all bets are off. So uh, if, you know, if you're returning a function that's going to eval, uh, they, they're no longer uh, going to guarantee anything. There are a couple of other places where they don't guarantee anything. I think if you use width, they do the same thing. They treat it as an eval scope. So in both those cases, you have to be very careful about uh, <coughs> what you're doing. Uh, but otherwise, if you're using closures, you should be okay. If you know what you're referencing, that's the only thing you're holding. So if it's that intelligent, why is it not storing uh, only title? Uh, why is it storing movies? It's not that intelligent. <laughs> And also, just to try to understand, yes, and uh, fun, you have made it as global variable to make sure uh, it's trapped in the. Yes, I wanted to live like for this page, yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree, nobody's going to write code like this. This first se section in the page is just demonstration of uh, scopes, and the second part is where people usually leak memory. Alright, uh, I, I mean, they had an eval this thing, but I dropped that example, so I'm not going to get into that. Now, I'm going to refresh the page again because, well, actually, I'm going to kill the tab and do this again because otherwise each uh, subsequent page is going to have all the stuff trapped open from the previous pages. Right, now we get into DOM. So, uh, again, this is basic stuff about DOM first. Uh, we know that, uh, so let's talk about how DOM actually works. Now, we know that all the browser objects are all in C++, right? Uh, this whole thing is not written in JavaScript. Whereas, but within JavaScript, you have complete <coughs> access to the DOM. You can traverse the DOM. Uh, the DOM objects themselves seem to reference each other because, you know, from, um, from an object, you can access its parent, you can access siblings and children. So, you from, if you're in the DOM, which is the attached DOM, you can just travel around anywhere. Um, and on top of that, uh, inside you also get access to that in JavaScript. In JavaScript, if I get access to an element, I can do parent element and I get access to another DOM element. I can do similarly the children, or I can do next sibling, previous sibling, and so on. So, uh, you know, let's figure out how this, I mean, let's talk about how this really works, because that's sort of relevant to this discussion. So, uh, even though those all, all those objects are in C++, what's happening is that there are proxy objects that are being created in the JavaScript world. The proxy object refers to the C++ object, and that's how you get access to it. But these proxy objects don't exist for every single element of the DOM. They're created on demand. So when you try and refer to something, it creates the object. Uh, until then, it's lazy. So you're not going to have too many JavaScript, uh, I mean, uh, too many uh, uh, JavaScript objects that represent DOM objects all the time. Uh, whenever you use them, they exist, and they're tied to uh, the DOM object. Yeah, thanks. Do you want me to repeat any bit, Oh, no. Oh, it's fine, okay. So yeah, I was saying that, uh, you have proxy objects in JavaScript that represent each element of the DOM that you end up accessing at some point or the other. But technically, it can create one proxy for each element that exists in the DOM. Now, in the DOM itself, these objects refer, each, refer to each other. So it'll, it'll clean up cycles. If, you know, if, you, if uh, some part of the DOM vanishes, it'll uh, collect it. And it's got its own garbage collection world in the C++ thing that we have no access to. Similarly, in the JavaScript side, we know the scopes work. Now, it's possible for JavaScript and DOM objects to refer to each other, and we know this. So um, <coughs> here are simple examples. 
we've got uh, the first button which is calling hold some DOM where we're just getting hold of uh, an element and uh, we're then removing it from the DOM but we're storing it in a globe. So now we're holding on to uh, an element there. Uh, now I don't think I actually mean, oh no I'm using the movie there down further. Right. Get in here. And now. We're actually not going to see much in this particular case, I think I forgot. So I hold some DOM and I see what it had and it had this string. Uh, just to run you through what happened because I'm not sure if all of you caught that. Hold some DOM was getting hold of this div called snafu, I believe, uh, up here, which had this string tora tora tora. I got hold of the div out here. I stored it in a JavaScript variable. I then removed the div from the DOM. So the C++ side is no longer referring to that object. But uh, I was able to clearly, uh, when I did see what it had, which is I, a second button I pressed, I was able to see the result. So clearly the C++ object lives and we know that. I mean, I can't show that to you in the inspector because the inspector does not show you the C++ object. But uh, we know that it lives. So from the JavaScript end, I can hold on to DOM. Uh, and then there's the reverse. So out here I've got this other button which is called attach handler, where I'm getting hold of uh, result and I'm attaching a, a click handler where I'm just going to print the movie title. Now, sorry, go on. Yeah, this may be a basic question, but is it cloning the object or is it just referring? How do you know which one it is? Uh, well, it technically you can't know. Object, right? Sorry? It just creates a new proxy object. Yeah, right? technically you can't know uh, what's going on in C++ world uh, because every browser is free to implement its own. But the most likely thing is that they're just giving you a proxy to the same thing, the same object again. There's no need for them to clone it because uh, I mean, uh, you, when you modify the object for multiple references, it should modify this, uh, the object for all references. So if you have multiple copies of in JavaScript of the same uh, object, you change the uh, inner, inner text or whatever, it, all of them will see that. So there's no need to clone it. They, 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 I mean, this is giving you a second proxy. <laughs> right. So does it mean that you uh, document that get element by ID, same snow uh, yeah. will give you the uh, same reference object or you think that's a that's a new JavaScript reference but I mean new JavaScript proxy but refers to the same C++ object. So um, you're asking me whether it shares the uh, reference in the JavaScript world, is that it? Yeah, so is it new JavaScript uh, reference related to a same JavaScript proxy? I'll, I'll repeat the question. Go on. Is it new okay, JavaScript Mike. Mike, Mike. Keep it. Mani, you should just keep it here. Yeah. JavaScript references referring to the same JavaScript proxy. It's not on. Your mic's not on. <laughs> <laughs> we did so many times. So, is it two JavaScript variables, references, referring to the same JavaScript proxy object, or are they two different proxy objects with their own references, which refers to the same C++ object? What do you, what do you expect is the answer. So, let me, let me put it a different way. Okay. If I get hold of the reference twice, and I set a property on one. Do you expect to see the property in the other? Yes. Both both will work because ultimately they refer to the same C++. No, no, but I'm setting a JavaScript property. If I do, you know, document get element by ID, and then I say dot x equal to, it's a JavaScript property. It has nothing to do with the C++ world, right? Okay, I got it. So you're saying if I modify, if I add a property, the JavaScript property, the other one wouldn't refer. So the other, the other one also sees it. That's why it's a shared reference. So it's a shared reference. Will it create a single proxy object or it will have multiple proxies to the same C++? Is this, uh, I mean, same question to that okay. and there is a single proxy. Okay. And, for this, and as I said for this reason, our expectation is completely compatible with it being the same proxy. I know that in JavaScript if I do something to one of those objects, every reference should, mod should get modified. So that's the reason they give you the same proxy. Uh, Tora Tora there is a proxy object, right? Or is it a reference object? Well, it's a reference to a proxy. Yeah, reference to a proxy. So wouldn't the reference to a proxy, you know, get deleted or something after the function is finished? It's, uh, global. it's global. I'm not done what. I'm deliberately oh, okay. making everything global. Oh, yeah. So, right. Uh, shall I move on? Uh, next example. So yeah, uh, I'm getting hold of result and oh, I think I mentioned this, but yeah, it's just a click handler on which I am uh, <laughs> accessing the DOM and doing this, right? Um, and now, uh, I should look for movies, that's okay. 
I have already taken a deep snapshot and uh, there's nothing to see. I don't know where the div is, oh this one right? Yeah. And let's just take a comparison. I think with the search it's now easier not to take a comparison. Oh there we go. So the movie is in there, it's held in closures. So we can see that uh, not only can we do this, but <coughs> the uh, uh, DOM world can hold on to uh, the JavaScript side. Now you could ask, is it just the proxy object holding on to the JavaScript side? How do you know it's the DOM side hold, the object holding on to the proxy side? And uh, the answer is that uh, for efficiency reasons, it makes sense for the DOM side to do it. Uh, if the JavaScript side is attaching click handlers to every proxy, then they'll have to, you know, always call into the JavaScript world to do something. So, for efficiency reasons, the DOM side actually knows that you know there's an event handler. Uh, but I mean, that's just a magic answer. I can't show you anything. So yeah, that's uh, <laughs> so. We, I mean, this the purpose of this was just to show you that you know we know that DOM uh, holds on to uh, JavaScript and uh, JavaScript can hold on to DOM between these two worlds of C++ and JavaScript. Now again, this is again later cycles that uh, somebody talked about. Uh, I, I think even as far back as 2007, you used to have problems where if you have a DOM that's holding on to, uh, I mean, has a click handler or whatever, and inside the handler you're holding a reference to the DOM, then you have a cycle across two worlds and it would never get cleared up. Uh, you're not going to see that anymore. Again, most modern browsers don't do that. So again, you're safe from those problems. So most of the you know issues where you can blame the memory leak on somebody else are gone. And uh, now, I mean, right now memory leaks are only mean that you know. Somehow your objects are being held onto by the global scope. That's all the memory leaks are. So define where we can start blaming and when we can for four, three. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Okay. I don't know when they fixed that. Uh, I know I six had the problem and they fixed it. So it's very old problem the cycle. Uh, so yeah. Um, I lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah, I was talking about cycles, and I said that cycles are not an issue anymore. So uh, every, what should I say, uh, every problem that you're going to have is going to be because somewhere in window, uh, you have access, I mean, you have a bunch of uh, objects, so your functions or your uh, uh, other objects that you define that are then holding on to other objects and so on. And somewhere they're holding on to DOM. And those things which you're no longer using are the memory leaks. That's really all it is. So, uh, I mean, at this point, clearly it becomes an error on, uh, uh, you know, on the JavaScript programmer side. But that said, memory leak, uh, I mean, memory managed languages have always had memory leaks. Uh, it's not just C++ world. I mean, the Java world and the .NET world has had its share of memory leaks. So, even there, the answer is the same. You know, you're holding on to stuff. If your application is complex enough, you're not going to realize you're doing this. And, uh, you know, if you have, you know, you'll probably have some map somewhere, some array somewhere that you're not paying attention to that's going to hold on to something. That's really all it is. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to sort of cover uh, through the presentation certain sort of common patterns that people use where they run into this uh, trouble. And, uh, you know, they may not be aware that uh, they're holding on to a reference. That's what the rest of the talk is going to be. Uh, before that, I was thinking we would actually take a look at a memory leak and see what it looks like. Um, let's go back to the browser. Right. I've forgotten what this does. I'm going to look at the file first. Right. So I've got a button called create some DOM, which says create a div, which is a mistake. Just say create some DOM. It's no longer one div, clearly. Uh, so what I'm doing is uh, when you say create some DOM, I make an element and um, I then push it onto this array, global array, and uh, and then I'm appending it to this container div. So every time you press the button, I'm just making uh, <laughs> this thing and putting it there. And uh, in the beginning, I, was just, I just created one div, but the memory grows so slow that I did this. And hopefully you can see uh, some results. Uh, then uh, I've got uh, this other function called start creating. Uh, what this is going to do is, as long as this flag is true, and it's a flag, so I call it a flag, it's going to set a timeout to create some DOM, and then it'll just again start creating. I'm doing this as a set timeout, and uh, it should be apparent why. If I don't do that, it's going to be an infinite loop. I'll never be able to stop it. This actually gives me access to be able to stop it. You should close the tag. 
Which tag? Sorry. Oh, thanks. Maybe that just made the demo more, more complex. I don't know. <laughs> but those are really, really forget. Uh, forgive. Uh, what's the word for it? Forgiving. Forgiving. Thank you. Right. Uh, stop is just going to turn the flag off. So this process of creating the this thing should, uh, div should stop. And remove is going to go to the container and just clear the uh, DOM. Right. Now we know by now that this is going to leak DOM because I've been storing all the elements in this array. So we know that from the JavaScript side, we're going to leak DOM. And uh, uh, what, let's take a look at it in the web inspector. Sorry? So this is just going to create that div. So I start creating. And now I think we can go to the task manager here and take a look at the memory growing. So yeah, it's at least, I mean, it's visible now at least, right? It's about, uh, 1 MB a second or something like that. So, I mean, you can see it's clearly growing and there's some CPU activity, but it's not 100, so I get a chance to stop this thing. Uh, now, what I'm going to do is um, let's take a look at the web inspector and see what we can see. So, it's going to get close to about 90 MB in like, uh, you know, 10 to 15 seconds. <laughs> Less than that, actually. So, I'm going to stop it now. And uh, I'll clear it. Now let's go here, take a snapshot, and let's see what it tells us. Now, this is annoying. Okay. So, according to this, the shallow size is like 1 MB of uh, I mean, this array. And, I mean, you can just tell looking at those numbers that it's not going to add up, right? Uh, it's nowhere near the amount of memory that we're actually using. So, uh, I mean, by now, I guess some of you already figured out what's, what the deal is. But uh, <coughs> the point is that it's very hard from this to figure out where the memory is being used. So the count is clear, is the count of the JavaScript object. But what's not represented here is the C++ objects. The DOM objects are not going to show up here. So if you're leaking memory, it's from this, at this point in time, you still can't tell where you're really leaking memory what the biggest uh, the thing to shoot is. Now, uh, I mean, the cons this gives you the constructor of the object which created the thing in the JavaScript side. Uh, the object count is again clear. Shadow size refers to the actual proxy object. The retain size is a bit confusing. It's trying to tell you what other JavaScript objects it thinks you are holding, but it's, it's wrong half the time, so you know, you really can't depend on it yet. Uh, and the retain size, the way it works, the, the, that thing has got to add up to more than the total amount of JavaScript memory you're using because multiple objects will. Uh, <coughs> uh, there's another view. Oh, I mean, out here you can go, you can see the summary, you can see the comparison. And the containment view is where you start following uh, back and figure out what's holding onto my object. Now, uh, the point of this is that uh, most in most other, uh, what should I say, um, places where you deal with memory leaks, the common way of looking at it is to figure out what's taking the most memory after you run the plugin for a while and then just find that and shoot it. You can't do that because, uh, you know, you'll, you'll take a lot of memory on, in completely innocuous places. The actual leak is somewhere in uh, DOM and this, you might have a, a large count of something but it's not going to be clear. And if you're using, you know, some kind of large JavaScript framework which is doing all these clever things with, you know, closures and so on, half your functions won't have constructors which have names. So you won't be able to figure out what those things are. You'll just see a bunch of function, function, function. And uh, there'll be a large count of them, and they'll be from different places. They're not even referring to the same object anymore. Uh, so it becomes quite hard using this to figure out, uh, uh, you know, thing, where the memory is leaking and you know how quickly you can solve the problem. I mean, the point of this was again to make sure that you're all in despair about this world yet, and we will eventually, hopefully, get the tools we need. Uh, from what I know, there is this. Uh, there are some experimental builds of Chrome that have some kind of. Uh, I mean, sorry. 15, okay. Five. No way. But it's a break after this, so you can take more time if you want. Okay. So, uh, you know, they're giving you some kind of memory counter or something of that sort. Uh, but yeah. All right. Uh, let's go back. Uh, I mean, I was getting to the meat of the discussion now, <laughs> which is what leaks memory and how it leaks memory. Uh, let's move on. So, uh, after it's leak memory, does it go away once you go to the next page? Sorry. No, uh, so 
I, I mean, again, this is very specific to uh, browsers and all that. So, uh, from what I remember, as long as you're within the same domain, they keep the memory. So, and even if you have multiple tabs with the same domain, they share memory. But if you if you navigate away from the domain, then they can clean it up. Uh, the best way to be sure is you actually just close the tab. But I mean, I, I, I can't tell you the exact answer. But from what I know, as long as you navigate away to a different domain, they know that you know they don't have to uh, keep the objects anymore. For some reason, they use the same process for everything in the same, in the same domain. I think it's because they're allowing you to communicate across uh, pages and stuff like that. Right. Uh, so, yeah, globals. I mean, this is uh, a trivial example, uh, but there's a, a specific point to this. So, creating a thousand divs and uh, appending it there, and uh, that's what this uh, button up here is going to do. Uh, I mean, it's already created. And when I clear, I will uh, just em empty them. And the question is, you know, how much are we leaking? Uh, I mean, the obvious thing is here again, LM is global. So let's figure out how much leaks, right? I've created a thousand divs. Uh, I mean, the comment actually gave it away, I think. Says that. So we actually don't leak much over here. The point is that we know that within the JavaScript, in the C++ world, you can navigate from objects to the siblings. So the expectation is that, you know, if you're holding on to one object, then why aren't you holding on to all the other others? Again, uh, this is just Chrome being really smart. Um, what is the thing called? I forgot. What are we looking for? Oh, it's a div, right? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we don't have any clearly. So it's it's being smart. It says that you know, uh, once you sort of uh, hold on to one object and you detach the DOM, then you are not expected to be able to navigate along the uh, the <laughs> siblings anymore. So they clear the siblings. They won't kill children, but uh, that's the deal. That was fast. Let's move on. Uh, prototypes. Okay, this is very specific to uh, one kind of problem that occurs when you're using uh, frameworks. So the framework I'm using in this example is Dojo, uh, which gives you this class classical structure, right? Uh, and the classical structure is very easy to reason about as opposed to prototype structure. So a lot of uh, frameworks do that. So this is one trap that people frequently fall into about how they leak memory when they do that. So let me show you that. So uh, the way uh, it works in Dojo, you can declare uh, a class, uh, declare a button producer, and I've got a field called button, and then I've got these three functions, right? Uh, so actually, uh, made a mistake. This is the solution to the problem, so we'll have to ignore that for now and pretend that I didn't show it to you. Uh, there we go. So uh, I've got this button producer and uh, on when you say create, it actually creates a button. And uh, what it's doing is it's storing the buttons in an array. And then when you say change color, it will change the color on the, all the buttons. Uh, let me actually show, what, show you what it looks like. So I produce buttons, I make them blue and they turn blue. And uh, that's it, right? Now, uh, the point is, when you clear, let's see what happens. So I've created buttons, and uh, you know, I've said that you know, the button producer says that whenever you do this, I'll iterate over uh, the buttons and I will change the color, right? Now, what I've done over here, um, let's go to the top. I've called uh, produce, right? And Produce is going to say is going to create a button producer, and for each one is going to create a button. <coughs> That's fine, and then uh, change color is being called the button producer itself, and I say blue. Now uh, the question is, if you look at empty, we just take going to the button area and setting the HTML to blank, right? So why is it that the buttons are being leaked? Uh, I mean. The, the trick over here is because of the fact that the prototype uh, thing, uh, prototypes are not classes. So a lot of things will give you this way to create fields called buttons. And uh, what they're going to do is mix it in. But they expect you to realize that when you do this, buttons is actually on the prototype object. So if I create two button produce, that they share the buttons, uh, what should I say, field. And so even though I'm deleting all the buttons, they share across all of them and so on. Uh, so I'm not going to bother running through this example. I mean, you know what to expect. Once I clear it, you'll see a bunch of buttons in there. And uh, the solution is just to push, make sure the button is declared on the, uh, I mean, the constructor. So the thing is, in JavaScript, if you set a property on an object, it's always setting it on the most 
uh, adjacent object, you don't go of the product chain. If you're trying to get it, then it will follow the product chain as far as possible until it finds that object. So uh, over here, the, the mix-in thing was causing an issue. So I mean, you'll have to beware anytime you use any such framework, you're not using JavaScript in its raw form. Uh, sometimes they do these things uh, that make code look very convenient, not necessarily what you uh, expect though. All right, um, so there was closures. All right, um, so uh, let's see what we do. So we produce an unsafe toggler and uh, toggle and empty. So unsafe toggler says that it, it returns a toggler to you function, right? Uh, the toggler is basically going to take a button and swap the background color and the uh, color itself. And uh, we're using Dojo here, but uh, it's the same as having an event listener. Uh, on click, it's going to call the toggler. And we return the toggler function. Now, what we're doing <coughs> is when we create these buttons, we're storing only the toggler functions. And uh, not the, uh, I mean, and we, I mean, but we've covered the sort of closure thing and we know that this is probably going to hold on, hold on to the button. Right, so um, on emptying it, it's not going to clear the uh, clear the area. So uh, I mean, since we've seen this example, I'm not going to explain. I'm not going to show you this thing in Hadoop. The question is, how do you fix this? Uh, because you know, in, in in case you want this kind of pattern, and uh, where we go? There we go. So sometimes you know you can't refer to the object. You have to break that closure. In this case, what we're doing is using ID. So you know that you know if you want to keep the function alive and make sure it's not referring to things in the scope, break it using a string or something else, sort, some immutable object, which is small, whereas the button object might be large and could leak. So I've covered the jQuery on piece and the Dojo widget piece. One question on uh, closure. Yeah. This uh, variable created. So does this mean that the uh, closure that was created, the is first created, you can still have number. This holds the button. It's okay, I'll, I'll just repeat the question. Right. So there are n number of variables that you would have declared. Uh, so and you would have, let's say, referred that variable alone inside your, let's say, smoking or index or whatever it is. Right. So does this mean that the JavaScript function is first created into a fast tree and, and the compiler finds out which are the closure variables which are potentially referred inside the you're getting into implementation of the uh, of the engine, and I, I really can't talk about that. I mean, I don't know enough about it. I could make a guess, but it's probably not a good idea. So it's better for me to just tell you what, what I know that what, what I know happens. I mean, this might again be specific to different browsers and different engines, uh, but this behavior is the same everywhere. But but you know for a fact that if you do eval, it will fail. Again, they're trying to be smarter about eval. What they're saying is that they can no longer guarantee anything with eval because eval they have no idea what you're really doing. Now they'll keep closing that boundary. You know, every once in a while they'll take a look and say, okay, this is a common pattern people use eval, and I can guess what he's trying to do over here. But you know, unless they can be hundred percent safe, they can't afford to reclaim those objects. So every time they notice something new, they'll sort of say, okay, this is a pattern with eval that we can afford to reclaim. But since eval essentially takes a string, they have no idea what the contents of the string are. You know, if they freeze a string, they may be able to figure it out. So they've got uh, ways to intern strings now and so on. But again, it becomes really complex, right? Okay. It, it's possible they could even create an immutable uh, function based on the string so that the same function can be repeated again. Yeah, that provided the string itself is not a parameter of some point. I mean, the minute the string starts coming from some text area, you have no idea what's going to happen anymore. <clears throat> so, uh, I, I mean, let's take a look at jQuery on because jQuery on is uh, jQuery is something that people use a lot. Uh, so there are multiple ways to use jQuery, and now there's a more recommended way. But let's look at the old way, and people know one problem with it, which is you know, uh, thing, but let me show you the memory leak issue. It's interesting because this one is not so apparent. Uh, so I've got this randomizer, and uh, it takes account as a uh, variable and stores it as a field, and then uh, make text is actually going to get hold of the span with that count and it's going to store a random number in there. So that's simple. Now uh, the button over here is going to say create one and I have a create many. They do similar things so we can pay attention, look at both. So create one says, it, every time you say create one it's going to increment this count. 
is going to make elements, get a randomizer, and then it says on, I mean, it finds this button, on click, uh, make text, uh, and it passes that function. Now, uh, what I've done over here is make elements is creating a div, which is a holder, inside which I'm setting a button with this ID and a span with the same ID, and I'm appending it to the container. So, uh, just to show you this, if you go here, I have this, and the expectation is that setting this will set the change the random number. Create many is just creating a thousand of those. So, they are just independently doubled. Now, clear is going to actually uh, remove, which is just going to set this in HTML. Now, at this point, I haven't trapped anything in a closure. I haven't really done anything. All I've done is, you know, uh, set this, you know, on click, touch this, right? But uh, let's see if this is leaking. And you know that it's going to have to leak, or I wouldn't bother showing you this. Uh, let's see. Onto the account. I'm not able to see anything yet. Let me just repeat this. I'm not sure what I missed. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Thanks. Right, so we can see we've got a thousand button elements, a thousand div elements, a thousand randomized elements. But we have. Let's look at the spans. We have six span elements. What's going on? Because for every button we created a span and we put them in a div. And uh, for every touch pair we have a randomizer. So why is it that we have thousand of each and just one span? I mean, six spans. Anyone want to guess? So, uh, I mean, it's a trick question. The answer is that I never refer to the span anywhere, so the proxy was never created. So again, remember that the memory provider can fool you. There actually are a thousand spans there, you just can't see them in this, because I never refer to them. I've referred to everything else in this creation process, which is why the proxy object exists. There are buttons and uh, randomizers and so on. So why six then? I have no idea. Must be this markup, the other parts. I don't even see any spans there, so I don't know. It's possible. So, uh, again, I mean, uh, none of this was a guarantee, right? They're not saying that they're going to not create the proxy object. So, I don't know, maybe they start creating a few and then they give up at some so point. Click the six buttons, right? Sorry? I think you click the six buttons, so it refers to the span to display the end. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Like, like, I probably clicked six buttons. I wasn't thinking about that. Good point. So, yeah. Um, so, the reason that the memory is being leaked is because of, uh, if, you, if you think about it, if jQuery is doing this, it's not magic. So they're going to have to hold on to uh, these objects. So if you use this pattern with jQuery, you are bound to leak memory to clear up the DOM. And uh, <coughs> the, I mean, I, I'm going to do the same thing with the safe manner and clear it up. So let's do that. And uh, here we go. Let's actually remove the. Oh, I don't have any snapshots anymore. Good. So create these, the same things they work. So we take here, I'll take a snapshot. And if you look at the difference, you should ideally not see these things. So yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I've got like four buttons and so on. So clearly it works. So, I mean, what's different? Uh, so there are two ways to solve this problem. There's one way which uh, is very recommended right now for other reasons, which is don't create a thousand handlers. So now they recommend that you know you attach the handler to the container object, and then you know you smartly figure out. In this case, it would be a bit annoying because you have to get hold of the button, figure out its ID, figure out the number, and then find the corresponding span. But you could do it that way. Or maybe you could traverse the DOM and find it. And uh, what I've done here is, with the current pattern, how do you fix it? So uh, now I've got handlers, uh, which, is, which, is a, which is a hash. And every time I create this, I'm storing uh, the function handler that I passed to the button, right? So earlier I was just passing the function inline, 
Now I've stored the function inside a, a variable and then I'm passing it in. And the that's stored in a hash. And now when I remove, I actually say jQuery off of all of those handlers on those objects, which then takes out those corresponding handlers and then it's safe to uh, clear the thing. So then when I call remove, it's fine. So uh, this is the correct way to do it. If you have a complex enough application, there are points where you might use the smart jQuery handlers, but some Sometimes even the containing div is going to vanish because you really don't want to attach everything to the body. Uh, that's actually going to slow down the processing. So you will attach them to some smart container. You know, if you have a widget, you're going to attach it to the container. But if the widget itself vanishes, you will have to take care of destroying the, uh, the handler. So you're going to have to store the handlers. So in a way, you know, you would think that as long as you're not holding global references, everything is fine. Here's a place where you actually have to create something like a global reference, at least global to that scope, so that you can clear it up. So if you if you start doing this stuff with event handlers, uh, you're going to have to be careful. You might actually have to create scope, and it will in your mind it'll look like you're making the problem worse before you fix it. So uh, <coughs> again, I mean, the safe way manner that jQuery recommends is fairly good for a small enough web application uh, where you know you know that the containing element is never going to vanish. It's only in cases where even no matter what container you've chosen, that container might vanish. And you don't want it to live forever. That you're going to have to look at this process and figure out and use jQuery off. Probably one of the least used jQuery functions right now. Uh, so, how am I doing the time? Yeah, okay. Ten minutes past. Okay, I'll do one more and that's, I'll stop. Uh, So at this point, I'm just talking about uh, the widgets of Dojo, uh, and this is interesting for a different reason. Again, it's something you know. If you're building an application, you might end up using Dojo. So uh, for large problems, so it's something to take care of. So let's go here, and I create widgets, and let's take a look at the memory. Meanwhile, let's show you what's going on. I've declared my button. It's a widget, so it's got a template, and it's got all these things. And when you click the button, it does some stuff and all this. It's, it's a dojo object, which which internally is going to create an HTML button. And I'm just creating a thousand of them, right? They're not stored anywhere. There's no references in global, nothing. If you take a look at the heap, we're going to see a thousand of these. Uh, button. There you go. There are a thousand buttons, right? So uh, the reason this is happening is that Dojo, uh, when you create a widget and with this template and so on, is going to create DOM and hold on to it. And the expectation that they have is that you actually call destroy when you're done with it. So uh, with the widget lifecycle, this might seem painful, but the reason they're doing this is because they're trying to give you another advantage. Once you have, when you're trying to build something with widgets, and you know it's it's big, and you know you know that it's not going to be easy for you to hold on to all these things. I mean, you're you're Factor your code base in a particular way, right? You've come up with these various layers and all that. That makes sense. But you're going to have to find ways to transfer control from one place to another. So typically, they give you access to magic ways of getting access to things. So for example, Dojo Digit, which is the widget library, allows you to say digit by ID and get hold of another widget from somewhere. So it's like it's a global hash map that it's maintaining. So instead of having you do the plumbing, they're doing the plumbing. But correspondingly, you know, you have to do the destroy. This is similar to the, what happened with the jQuery click handler. I mean, you know, there uh, I had to show the click handlers, and that's the reason why I had to destroy it. So, if you find that you know something is letting you access stuff without storing it in a variable, then you have to question that you know somebody is doing it if it's not you. So, the minute you find that you have access to things across scopes, and you're not storing it in a global variable, somebody must be doing it. And uh, if they do, they'll have a life cycle that let you destroy it. So, that was the point of this. So, um, I think I'm done there. So, I just uh, I just take questions at this point. Can we take them offline? Yeah. yeah. I think some people won't take a coffee break. Yeah, Thanks, Michelle. Well